Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We're 65 games into the season and just about done. The The month of March As always. I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, we've got a heck of a Battle of Alberta to talk about, but let's start at the beginning of the week before we get there. Yeah, that was a game of the year, frankly. So, but yeah, let's we'll get start there. We'll tease it. Yeah. Um, the Calgary Flames played the San Jose Sharks on uh, Tuesday, the 22nd in the Saldome, and San Jose ended up winning that one 4-3 to three against the Flames. Not the result I think we're all looking for in this one. I thought the Flames were pretty solid and in control, but the Sharks just managed to stick around all night. They put pressure on the Flames all night. The Flames had the lead twice, and you know every time the Flames kind of went even or even when they were down on the Sharks, they kept going. I think the big story of this is, both teams had resiliency and determination. Yeah, and uh, last week uh, I mentioned on our uh, like preview uh, look ahead for this week uh, that you know this team could uh, snipe the Flames uh, with because like they're talented enough where if the Flames aren't playing uh, their top game that you know they have enough talent where they could beat Calgary and. Unfortunately, in this game, they did, and uh, it credit to San Jose for having that resiliency, and it, it was just a lack of focus and attention to details, especially on the defensive side of the game, and frankly, two horrifically bad goals by Markstrom with the first and the second goal. Yeah, I think that's fair. Those were not great goals for Markstrom. Um, but overall, I mean, I don't know. It was, was it the flames best game? No, but like I said, I give them credit for sticking with it. And I think it would have been easy for a previous version of this flames team to have got defeated after that team. O'Mayor goal. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And like Calgary pretty much played well enough where they could have won, but you know, just too many mistakes at inopportune times and you can't win them all. And unfortunately, this is one they dropped. That's a that's a good way to look at it. You can't win them all. And after that, the Flames had another home game. It seems like every game we're playing these days is at home. They had two days off, and they took on the Arizona Coyotes in the Saddle Dome. The big, I guess, story coming to this game, and we'll cover it more a little bit later in the show, was Sean Monahan being scratched. Um, but the Flames ended up taking on the Coyotes, and... This was a, a 4-2 Calgary win against the Coyotes. I still, I don't know why, but I smile when I see the Coyotes still wearing those old retro jerseys. Yeah, they're, anytime a team goes from a unique jersey to some boring, bland thing, and then back to their original unique jersey, it's always a good thing. I'm t- talking to you, Anaheim. You know, go back to the eggplant. But, um, you know, it's... One of those things that, like, the Coyotes jerseys after Gretzky took over as coach went from being a unique, different jersey to, like, the most bland, boring jerseys in the entire NHL. And so them spicing it back up to their original ones makes a big difference. And uh, probably one of the last times that the Flames will probably ever play the Arizona Coyotes. But uh, we'll see. Why do you think that? Do you just don't you think they'll get moved sooner rather than later? Yeah, how do you say? I think that uh, college arena thing, the five thousand seat arena, I think that's kind of a placeholder until they can formalize the uh, documents with some other place, and that oh, we'll play here until they can play somewhere else. Because I I do not see them playing in that arena next season. I'd be shocked frankly i can so. see that you know because it's like i don't know the, about next season i think i think it's maybe too late to make that change next season i think they'll well, play um, at least one year there well atlanta uh they didn't announce that the team was moving to winnipeg until like may uh and right but played. that's a yeah i mean we, we won't get into the politics there but that that ownership group walked away i don't think that this one's gonna do that but yeah i mean well yeah. either way could could happen maybe not we won't spend too much time talking about the Coyotes. Yeah. Um, what do you think of this game, Matt? 
Um, I thought that, well, frankly, this was a typical Arizona game where it was kind of a plodding, boring game. Um, it was nice to see that uh, for the two goal scorers for Arizona, that they both got their first NHL goal because that's always nice to see when it doesn't actually contribute to them winning the game against Calgary. Uh, beyond that, uh, Calgary just controlled the play and didn't really let Arizona have too much at any point. Yeah, that's fair. Um, you know, you were mentioning the first two two guys who got their first goals and you know looking at this roster and i noticed this when i was sitting in the press box i don't know who half these players are i don't even know who either of their goalies are like this is just a a team of nobodies yeah well uh, the only reason why i know uh Vimelka is uh because uh, he was drafted by nashville and uh, you know uh, nashville anytime they draft a goalie i always have a my eye on them because they they're they seem to have a knack for drafting quality goaltenders but yeah uh the rest yeah uh it it looks very much like a rebuilding team's roster where it's like um okay that's a player sure <laughs> yeah i mean we you know we all know um you know and we won't spend a lot of time talking about them but yeah you know, we all know a few, probably a handful of guys in this team but there's guys just like who are these people and where do they come from yeah it there's probably about 10 players on that team that, uh, you know, like I didn't even know that Louis Erickson was still playing in the NHL until like one of our guys hit him. It's like, Oh, okay, cool. I, I thought he left like three years ago, <laughs> but yeah, just one of those Were things. Were you surprised to see Mark Sherman for this one? No. How would you say after that bad game against San Jose, I think you had to give it to Mark like, I think they probably initially were going to put uh, Vladar in this one. But with how bad that San Jose game went, I think they needed to, just for confidence sake, because him stewing on, like, two really, really bad goals that frankly caused the Flames to lose, you know, and carrying that into Edmonton, like, that could have derailed him a bit. And so getting back on the horse... I think was more important in this case. Yeah, I can see that. And and then that was a similar similar thought I had when I looked back at this one and who is in. I think, like you said, it was probably penciled in for Vladar and changed last minute um, after what we saw in San Jose. Yeah. And, you know, it didn't hurt. And the Flames also have two days off uh, today and tomorrow before they're back in action against Colorado. And the spacing is more even. Like, it's every other day. Uh, till April 6th. So, um, you know, like it, it's a little bit more balanced and even. So it gives the Flames more of an opportunity to have proper rest for Markstrom. There was definitely a difference in the Flames here in the first 20 and the last 40 in this one. And I don't know exactly what was said or what adjustments were made, but you could definitely tell that they came out a little better as a team to start that second period. Yeah, they certainly played down to Arizona's level at the beginning of the game. But, like, even then, like, Arizona had it, it because of the fact that they're a bad team, they're also playing for spots for next year. And so, like, they're giving their full effort. They're just not very good. But, you know, they gave their full effort in the first period and, like, outshot the Flames and outchanced the Flames. But, you know, it. It's like, okay, yeah, that that was fun. Okay, time to put this one away. And Calgary did just that. And then they had a game uh, the next night. This was a back-to-back. -back. Arizona was Friday. We weren't sure what we were going to expect out of a tired Flames team on Saturday for Hockey Night in Canada. But boy, did they deliver. This was one of the highest scoring Battle of Alberta games ever. The Calgary Flames beat the Edmonton Oilers 9 to 5. I'll say that again. The Calgary Flames beat the Edmonton Oilers 9 to 5, and the last 2 minutes of the game we had the entire 20,000 seat Saldome chanting we want 10. Yeah, this is one of those games where the Calgary Flames actually outscored the Calgary Roughnecks who also played yesterday and won. 
and you know it's like um okay sure that that happens <laughs> You this know, is one of those games where it's like, you know, yeah, it's great we scored nine, but, like, should we talk about the fact we let five in? Frankly, the five goals, yes. Like, frankly, that's not, you know, acceptable. And the lack of discipline against a team like Edmonton uh, caused this game to be closer than it really should have been. Um, you know, like when you have Dreisaitl and McDavid on the power play and you keep, you give them five straight opportunities, they're going to put the puck in the net. And, you know, Dreisaitl's uh, tied an NHL record for lowest plus minus while scoring a hat trick with minus four. So, bravo. Yeah, golf clap there. <laughs> uh, but, you know. You need it, some sort of record. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that... Like, the Flames, it, it, when they weren't shorthanded, absolutely annihilated the Edmonton Oilers. And, uh, like, it, the only thing that made Edmonton even remotely close in this game was that power play. And there wasn't really a goal against Markstrom that I could squarely fault him like, oh, that was a real stinker of a goal. No, the, the goals that Edmonton scored were all really good. It's just that the Flames put themselves in a bad spot to allow those opportunities for the Oilers to score. Yeah, I think that's very much a, a fair assessment that the Flames put themselves in a bad spot. I mean, three of Edmonton's goals were scored on the, on the power play. The Flames probably, and I think both teams took too many penalties, but especially Calgary took too many pen penalties. All Calgary's nine goals were five on five, which says something, but yeah, I mean, it, it's exciting. We got nine, but it, it says something that you let five in. And I don't think you can fault our goaltender on any of them. I think they were really just either, like you said, um, you know, power play goals for Edmonton or more of a systems breakdown and giving Edmonton too much time in front. Yeah, well, like, if you go through the goals, like, the Broussard goal was a tip right in front. That hits you or it goes in. So, nothing Markstrom could do. The dry side of the goal, it was a breakaway. He scored. Okay, sure. Uh, the Nugent Hopkins goal, it was a pass across off the post and in. Uh, you know, great shot. And then the two dry side power play goals, well, yeah, it's like Ovechkin scoring on the power play. Are you surprised? No. So... You know, like, he has that kind of a shot, and he will beat you if you give him any time and space. The Flames did, and they got burned twice. Like, there's literally nothing marks from... Like, if you sub him with any goalie in the league, those five goals go in. Like, there's not anything that could, be, could have been done other than the Flames, you know, preventing dumb power play chances for the Oilers. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, it's it's something you got to talk about, right? Anytime you give up five goals, you generally deserve to lose. And mm -hmm. this was this was a pretty exciting game. And you know, when's the last time we saw the Flames score nine goals? I think it was a game against Columbus a couple years ago. Um, it was against uh, Bobrovsky when he was there, his last season with them, and it was a nine-six game. It was very much a similar feel. Uh, to the highest one. scoring Battle of Alberta game in the Saldome was a 9-6 Edmonton win in, I think, 84. So it's nice that we've righted that wrong in the record books. Yeah. I was yeah. honestly sitting up in the press box just waiting, and it's like, you know, how long until Koskinen's out of the net? And I think it was fair to say that, all you know, just like all these goals weren't, um, you know, weren't Markstrom's fault, a lot of them weren't Koskinen's either. And that was what I was trying to balance is, when are they going to have enough of Koskinen, even though I think you could say Koskinen wasn't terrible? No, and, like, that defensive performance by the Oilers, like, honestly, if I was the general manager, it'd be like uh, looking at all six of those guys and going, I do not think you guys are actually NHL-caliber defensemen as defensemen. And, like, that's a very troubling sign. Like, there was nobody on the ice that was playing even cogent hockey at all defensively for the Oilers. Like, and there's a reason why they were minus 35, which is a mind-numbingly bad stat. It was I just think the goalie bad. was their... I, I would think Koskinen was their best player. 
Yeah, and Smith didn't play bad either. Like it was basically the no, forwards Sm- doing their Smith thing. Smith made a and- lot of usual Smith moves, if you will. Like I noticed, yeah. you know, Smith a couple times went way out of his net to play the puck and just the shit you don't want your goalie to be doing. Yeah, well, there's a reason why he's their goalie, and not ours anymore. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, it's – the Oilers are really bad. And, like, if they do actually qualify for the playoffs, which I still don't think they will, you know, they're going to get hammered by L.A. or uh, Colorado in the first round. Like, they're just – you know, it, it's – I don't think they've got more than a round in them. No, like, I, I don't even see it going past five games. And, like, if it does, it'll be because McDavid and Dreisaitl, like, took over a game or two. Like, it's, yeah, it's not going to be pretty. No, it won't. It'll be, let's just, I know a lot of people want a battle of Alberta, and I don't think the Oilers will last long enough to get to the Flames. No. Like, unless they somehow fluke out and match up with us, which could happen, uh, I, I just, I... I don't see them actually making it out of the first round and the amount of hurdles that they'd have to hop to get to be the the first wild card team uh, like I don't see how they leapfrog uh the central division teams to get into that first spot while being below the third spot in our our division so we'll see I yeah I just don't see Edmonton making it out of the first round at all well, with that, if we take a look at the stats, the Flames have played 65 games now. So, good portion of their season now done. We've got, what, about 18 games left. Uh, 40 oh. wins, 17 losses, and 8 overtime losses for a total of 88 points. The Colorado Avalanche have 98, so they've got a 10-point lead on us. In our division, L.A. is at 81, and Edmonton's at 77. And then in the wild card race, we have St. Louis at 79, and Vegas at 76. So, um Matt, I think at this point it's pretty. I would say pretty. Sa- I'm going to knock on wood when I say this. Pretty safe. Say LA's not going to leapfrog Calgary. Yeah, things would have to go seriously awry. Uh, where like LA would have to beat us in the the meetings that we do have against them. Uh, we play them uh, once this month and once next month, and then uh, they'd also have to outperform and like frankly the flame schedule is weaker than la's so like it makes it that much more difficult for the kings to catch us but like the oilers and golden knights like they're not going to catch us at all so um like uh someone posted on calgary puck uh stat where if calgary went 500 the rest of the way the oilers would have to go 14 one and one just to tie us and it's like yeah that's not gonna happen so yeah i'm i'm not as worried about the oilers i'm more worried about la i mean they've got two games in hand i i don't know i just don't think la yeah like you said something have to go seriously wrong yeah like that one year where like we were so far ahead of vancouver and like like 13 points up on them and then like lost it on the last game of the season like i think it was 08 09 so yeah yeah i'm hoping it's not gonna be that close but uh yeah no and uh it it, it'll be interesting to see just like how the rest of our division stacks up because la edmonton and vegas are all within five points of each other and who knows where the it will land frankly for any of those teams it's definitely going to be a tight season in the West. I think the East, we pretty much know where everyone's going to be. But I think right now in the West, it's going to be it's going to be a tight one. Yeah. Well, Matt, we have a whole bunch of milestones this week, which is kind of interesting. Uh, looking at some players who've got some milestones and some interesting things going on. So let's quickly run through these before we get to our next discussion topic. Um, in the Arizona game, Johnny Goudreau scored his 200th career goal which is interesting. Uh, Matthew Kachuk got his 30th goal of the year versus Arizona, which is number 140 of his career. Does it seem weird to you that Kachuk is only 60 goals behind Johnny? Not really. Um, Goudreau's always been more of a playmaker. So um, the fact that Kachuk is quickly catching him, uh, it's not really that surprising. 
The Flames' top line all now have 30-plus goals, and we actually have four 30-plus goal scorers this year. If we take a look, we have Johnny Goudreau at um, 30, Matthew Kachuk at 32, Elias Lindholm at 34, and Andrew Mangiapane at 30. So those are the four guys who have uh, 30 or more goals this season. The last time that happened for the Flames was in 93-94, and there's still a lot of time for those guys to get some more points. And the last time... uh, the a team had four thirty goal scorers by game sixty five was the ninety five ninety six Pittsburgh Penguins, which you know had a couple of good players in Lemieux and Yager and you know a few others. Yeah, that's good company to be in for sure. And then I also made a note here that uh, Erasmus Anderson has four, has forty points now this season, um, and that's I think his career high before this is twenty two. So a guy who's definitely elevating himself into a top top two role this year and embracing that and Noah Hannafin playing his 500th career game against Edmonton, which I mean, you know, I think a lot of us think Noah's a lot older than he is because he's been around the league forever. When you're thinking 500 games, this is still a 25 year old defenseman. Yeah. And, uh, just going back to Raz, like, uh, his, uh, 40 points that puts him 18th overall among all NHL defensemen, and he's close to the top 12, uh, only two points behind, like, five players. So, And makes uh, him the fifth highest point getter on the team this year. Yeah, and he has definitely uh, been a, a breakout player for this team and really emerged, frankly, as a number one, number two defenseman. And him and uh, Noah Hannafin have really solidified that first pairing yeah they sure have total points right now johnny goudreau at 90 matthew kachuk at 82 elias lindholm at 68 and andrew mangiapani 40 and then rasmus anderson or sorry andrew mangiapani 45 and rasmus anderson 40 so yeah definitely a lot of our young guys leading this team and i would say the guys that need to be getting lots of points we're seeing getting those points yeah, and it's interesting to note that uh, both Johnny Gaudreau and Matthew Kachuk, as of this recording, are both in the top five in NHL scoring, which actually makes four of the five players in Alberta uh, that are at the top of the NHL in points. So just a weird time, frankly, because I, like, I can't even remember the last time that somebody was it, that high up in the standings. No, I can't either. I'd have to go back and take a look. It would probably take a little bit to research that. Well, Matt, uh, trade deadline recap. We talked a little bit over the last couple weeks about the trade deadline, and uh, the Flames not as active as we thought. Three transactions made. Brad Richardson was placed on waivers the day before the trade deadline, got claimed by Vancouver. So as such, the Calgary Flames went out and acquired Ryan Carpenter from Chicago for a fifth-round pick in 2024. And then the Flames traded Michael McNiven to Ottawa for future considerations. We got him on future considerations from Montreal just a few weeks earlier. So let's break these down one at a time. Um, Brad Richardson claimed on waivers by Vancouver. Are you surp- First off, surprised to see him on waivers. Secondly, surprised to see him claimed? Um, no and no. I It made sense to waive him just to try and get some extra cap space flexibility. Um whether you stuck him in Stockton after if he didn't go and get claimed or if you lost him outright. And the Flames do have too many bodies. So losing Richardson, like especially if they were already kind of expecting to get Carpenter, uh, it didn't make sense to have Richardson on the, the, the pro team anyway. So uh, the fact that he got claimed by Vancouver, you know, at least he'll be playing in the NHL. You know, I think firmly believe that if uh, he had uh, passed through waivers, he would have been playing in Stockton. Do you think that now knowing what we know and looking at our roster, that was the right roster move? Yes. The right guy to wave? Yep. I would agree. I think you could have done him. I think you also could have done Richie. Yeah. Uh, I, the don't difference, think, uh, I don't think Richie would have been as ready to get claimed. Well, uh, the difference is, is that uh, Richie ha- at least has that physical banger That's aspect true. to his game where Richardson's more of a linear defensive forward. Um, you know, like he can play that physical style, but it's less prevalent with him. Uh, Richie, like especially in the playoffs, if the flames need to have more of a 
crash and bang type fourth line, you know, he can easily slot in and be like a guy who can drop the gloves and create havoc that way, uh, playing like a Michael Furlan light type role, um, which that's more viable for what this team is at this point than what uh, Richardson brought. Yeah, that's that's true. I think I think that yeah, Richardson is more of sort of a generic number thirteen where uh, Richie has yeah, you're probably right. He he really has a place on the team and an identity piece. Yeah, because like, how would you say like in the playoffs, like say Dylan Dubé is struggling and like they're not wanting to put Monahan in the lineup. You know, a guy like Richie, uh, just because of his size and physicality would have more of an impact than a guy like Richardson. Very true. Um, so the next the next uh, transaction that was made, the Calgary Flames went out and got um, Ryan Carpenter from the Ottawa Senators for a fifth-round pick in 2024. Ryan Carpenter is a 30-year-old center with a right shot. Um, he, this season, has played 60 games, three goals, eight assists for a total of 11 points. In his career, he's played 301 goal games, 26 goals, 42 assists for a total of 68 points. Um, this guy's really, I think, another generic fourth-line centerman. I And the main difference between Carpenter and Richardson is that Carpenter is more like Richie, where he can crash and bang. He's a tenacious player, good on the face-offs, good defensive forward. Great face-off guy for what yeah. he is in the lineup. Yeah, like he's going to like I I'm assuming like as the playoffs progress, I would assume that he'll play the Stefan Yell type role where, you know, he comes out for the face off and then skates as fast to the bench as possible whenever an important face off is ready. Between him and Yarncroc. That's interesting. Yeah, I can hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I could I could see them using him that way, especially in the playoffs. Um, do you think that the, do you think that the fact that they lost Richardson made them go get Carpenter where maybe they weren't expecting to? Like, I'm kind of thinking that the flames probably went out and got Carpenter because they lost Richardson, but I think they probably wanted to use that pick on a defenseman. I actually think that they waived Richardson because they were closing in on the deal on Carpenter and they just wanted so? to okay. make sure that, uh, cap out and then cap in type of thing. Because, like, if you're agree agreeing to a trade in principle with the other team, in this case Chicago, um, you know, like, you can have the framework and they, you just have to say, okay, I need to clear the space and place guy on waivers, done. And then when the 12 o'clock hit, then, you know, then it was when uh, the Carpenter deal was announced shortly thereafter. So, you know, I think it was one of those where the, it, like, if the Flames didn't get Carpenter, Richardson wouldn't have been waived. Huh. Interesting. I didn't think of that, but yeah, you're, you could definitely be right there. Um, are you surprised at the end of the day, the flames don't end up with another blue liner? Uh, I never really thought that it was much of a need, uh, frankly, because like, if you look at, uh, between the NHL and Stockton, like the top six is the top six, Michael stone. He's shown that he can just drop, be airlifted anywhere in the lineup and he'll do a okay. And then you have Valimaki and Mackie down in Stockton if the need comes. So like right there, you've got nine NHL defensemen and you know, like both Mackie and Valimaki are frankly ready to be in the NHL. So it's one of those where like, if the flames ran into two or three injuries, like they wouldn't be, as desperately in need where you know like in past years like they had six guys and then it's like um who's the random fill-in guy so you know it, i didn't really think it was necessary this time like we didn't need we didn't need a Fantenberg or a, a forbort or you know Gustafson or whatever no, and I guess maybe we're just, you know, and I guess me and other fans who are looking for them to get a defenseman, I think maybe we're just used to that's what Brad has done the last couple of years. So, you know, sort of as a habit, that's what we maybe expect him to do again. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, like, the quality face-off guy on the fourth line 
this time was more important than uh, getting that d depth defenseman. And like, it, honestly, if they had stand Pat after getting Yarncroc, I think that would have been perfectly fine too. Do you look at Carpenter as an upgrade over Richardson? Oh, definitely. Me too. Big time. Yeah. And and we'll talk about it, but I think that this deal has facilitated the ability for them maybe to move Monahan in the lineup, but we'll get there. Michael McNiven, this is weird to me. Like, the Flames brought him in for nothing from Montreal two weeks before this, let's say. I'd have to check the exact number of days. Um, then the then they go out and send him to Stockton. He, he does nothing, really, for Stockton. Didn't even dress once. And then they end up sending him out to Ottawa. And it's like, why acquire this guy if... You're not going to use him. You're just going to send him out again. Like, I don't know. The whole thing kind of baffles me. Um, the only way I could see a, a specific need for that is if they were perhaps looking at trading Vl Vladar or something or Wolf possibly in a deal and they just needed a body in case of. But even then, like, that makes little sense. Because, like, if you're making that kind of a trade, then why don't you just ask for fill-in guy from... Well, that's it. I think if trading. you needed a, a goalie like that, whatever team you were trading with could have provided you with a, a goalie like that as part of the package. Yeah. It, it is a little weird. It, how would you say it? The only other thing I could think of is that maybe uh, Montreal came back to them after the Toffoli deal and said, hey, we just need to get rid of an extra contract. And could you just kind of like shoehorn then this in as part of that just because we need to get rid of one? That's about the only other thing that would make any sense to me. But yeah, it, it's just a weird situation the whole way around, so... Yeah, and even then, I mean, if, I don't know, you would think the GMs would do their due diligence. If Ottawa needed a guy, you think they would have just made that move with Ottawa at the time. Like, the whole thing is just very weird. And I, I'm I'm glad Calgary didn't give up an asset to get McNiven and then give him away for nothing. But just, yeah, just an odd scenario all the way around. I can't remember the last time you've seen a guy traded twice in the same season for essentially nothing. Yeah. And it makes you wonder how Michael McNiven feels, like, you're getting traded around the league for no return. You're worth nothing to anybody. Yeah. Yay, I'm wanted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's weird. Like, yeah, it, it's just, yeah. yeah One of our... Like, uh, it's just a very strange situation, but... Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I just, I've never been traded, thankfully, but I can imagine that, okay, if you're traded for a, you know, big player, you feel awesome, they gave up an asset to get me, I'm wanted, I'm excited, but when you're essentially traded twice for nothing, that's got to mess with you a little bit. Well, you know, and, like, uh, I, I remember uh, Chris Draper, uh, who played with Detroit for a number of years, he was a Winnipeg Jet and got traded for $1.00. And, you know, like, I recall him mentioning that, like, he used that as motivation to get better because, you know, like, stick it to Winnipeg after that. And, yeah. Which I can like, see, it, but, I mean, you know, like, McNiven didn't even play, so if he's not playing, it's hard to use his motivation. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with uh, with these GMs, but just odd to see him come and go that quickly. Matt, we had a question that was asked uh, on Facebook from Andrew J.D. Jepson, one of our longtime listeners. Now that we're now that we are considered legitimate contenders for the cup, how do you believe we stack up against other contenders now that many of the bigger moves have been made before the deadline? He asked this before the deadline, so let's rephrase this. Now that we've seen how the pieces shook out of the deadline, how do you think that the flames stack up? Frankly, like there there are five teams that in my books are ahead of everybody else. Um, Tampa, Florida, uh, Carolina, Colorado, and us. And, uh, frankly, uh, the three Eastern teams, uh, you have like a more full offense team in Florida, a more full defense team in Carolina, and then a balanced team in Tampa Bay. Um, it, It'll be interesting to see which one of those. I I'm honestly assuming that one of those three will be in the Stanley Cup Finals. It'll be interesting to see which one. And if I which had of to those bet five right teams now, do you think did upgraded the most leading up to the deadline? Uh, probably Florida. 
with Drew. Uh, well, besides us, like uh, Calgary was the best in terms. Of, we had the best deadline because we got two impact players. So you know, Florida would be the second best in getting Claude Giroux. The other teams didn't really do much to massively improve. Like uh, uh, getting uh, Manson and. Uh, Cogliano for uh, Colorado, like it helps, but you know you're nibbling around and or Tori Lekin and like it helps, but it's not like a major impact guy. And you know, uh, th- frankly, like in the Eastern Conference of those three elite teams, I still think it's Tampa's to lose just because they are more balanced than the other two teams. But yeah, I think, uh, that's, it, I think that's fair. But it, it easily could go any which way. I would be more surprised if any of the other five make it through. Um, make it through to the finals? Yeah. Like, it, how would you say, like, you look at each of the other teams and the only other one that stands out that could, I think, is probably the New York Rangers just because they're built more like Tampa Bay where they're balanced kind of all over, um, just not as good. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's one of those things that, uh, from the East, it, it's very much, uh, more even one through eight. Uh, but like th- those three are a uh, cut above and for the West it, it's Calgary and Colorado. And frankly, the flames that, uh, series that they lost against Colorado a couple years ago was for this season was probably the best thing that could have happened to them just because of the fact that the flames modified the makeup of their team to play better against the avalanche. And, uh, like we're seeing guys that are quicker on the ice guys like getting Cali yarn croc, uh, that can keep up with and a more mobile defense group that can keep up with, uh, the fast forwards from Colorado and with the Flames clearly having the decisive advantage in the physicality department on every team in the NHL, like it's not just Colorado, um, it, it will literally be a slugfest and it, the, it, it'll frankly come down to who's less banged up uh, when it comes time for Calgary to play Colorado if that's how the conference finals stack up and you know if some team beats Colorado on the way and Calgary does advance to the conference finals there is not a team in the central that I think can beat Calgary and um yeah I think Calgary would literally beat any other team other than Colorado and I I, think even then I think going back to Andrew's question, I think Calgary definitely had of those teams, I would say of the whole league, probably the best lead up to the deadline. They didn't do their business last minute, but they got to Foley. They got yarn croak. Um, you know, they got Carpenter and they gave up nothing from their roster and not, you know, no physical bodies went out, which I think is a very impressive, um, v- very impressive trading by Tre living. So I think Calgary's definitely the one that stacks up the best that way. We did see, I mean, if we look at sort of what will affect Calgary, at least in my mind, L.A. didn't do anything. We saw, we saw, you know, the Avalanche make some moves. I would say nothing that really is groundbreaking there is going to change their roster a whole ton. I think that on the in the Western side, I think uh, we stack up, I would say, as good as everybody else. And I think Calgary might be built to go deeper than Colorado is now. Yeah, and... Like, frankly, for teams that generally are successful in the playoffs, the Calgary Flames are the best team. Just because yep. the teams that tend to be the banger physical guys with skill, the, you look at the Stanley Cup Finals like the last 10, 12, 15 years, usually one of those teams is in the Stanley Cup Finals, and more often than not, that's the team lifting it. So we'll see. It's definitely great to be in this position for a change. So, isn't it? It's not something we're used to. No, and like you've mentioned in the past, like the, uh, like the end of February, March faltering that this team's had. 
And even then, like, despite being 24 and 2 in the last 26 games, the Flames haven't really been overly sharp, I think, for like the past month, but they've been able to, due to the coaching staff, uh, able to refocus during games, even if they're not being sharp. And like the Arizona game or even the Edmonton game where, you know, like mental mistakes led to goals against and, you know, it, they were able to just keep on returning to their play and pushing forward. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely part of it. And I think part of it's too just that we're seeing, you know, the entire team, everybody knows their role. And when somebody's faltering, someone else is stepping in to fill that. And how often have you and I talked about either the depth is scoring and the top line's not, or the top line scoring nobody else is. And I think that, you know, we're seeing scoring throughout the lineup this year and we're seeing players playing a more complete game. It's not just all about scoring and getting points. And I think because we're seeing them playing a more complete game on all three parts of the ice, that the flames are weathering the storm better. And even if they go into a bit of a funk, I think, like you said, they've had some games. They haven't looked great, but they're putting together a better hockey game. And that's going to bail you out more often than not. Yeah. And like, frankly, like they're second in the NHL in goals against, uh, with only uh, four more surrendered than the uh, Carolina hurricanes. And, you know, like there's only like five or six teams that are under 180 goals against, and the Flames are at 160. So, like, they're doing a exceptional job defensively. And, uh, like, their goal differential at plus 71 is only bested by the Florida Panthers in the entire NHL. So, it'll be interesting to see um, just how all of that stacks up moving forward. And especially, like, this upcoming week. Uh, where the Flames are playing uh, four good teams in a row. Well, Matt, one of the big stories this week was the fact that Sean Manahan was a healthy scratch for two games. He sat out both the Arizona and the Edmonton game. And a lot of Flames fans had different opinions on this. Some said, you know, it's past time. Some people couldn't believe that he's sitting out. This is a very polarizing um, part of the week for Flames fans. So um, let me ask you a couple questions here. Were you like we Sean Monahan's been the Flames' number one center really since he got here, and you know been playing with Goudreau this year. We've seen him in a different role. Were you surprised to see him as a healthy scratch? No, um, he has been. How would you say like as the seasons progress, like he's trying to get better on the defensive side, and I feel he has improved defensively. Uh, his defensive side of his game he's engaged more physically but you know when you're not scoring and like yeah i don't think he has a goal in 16 games it and he's not authentically a physical forward where like a guy like richards or uh, ryan carpenter is you know it's tough uh, like if you're not producing on the offensive side of it to include you and like frankly it, moving forward like i could see monahan sitting out most of the games uh for the rest of the season uh potentially um unless they can find him a spot on the wing possibly uh for the like as like the third line left winger or something along those lines but well let's not go there quite yet um i agree with you i think you know he hasn't he hasn't looked great and he hasn't scored a lot. And that's what Monaghan's identity is. And I think on a Daryl Sutter team, he's not your fourth line center. Like when you're out there with Lewis and, and Lucic, that's a line that you're expecting to be able to bump and grind and hit. And Monaghan's not that guy. And it just feels like he's, I don't know if you think there's a fair assessment, but it just feels like Sean Monaghan's lost. He doesn't have a role on the team. Yeah. And entirely. And, and I think Kelly Yarncroke coming in and they're playing Yarncroke as a center, that really sort of took Monaghan's spot. Yeah, entirely. And uh, Yarncroke at this point is a better player than Monaghan. And for the role of the fourth line center, Carpenter is a better player than Sean Monaghan is right now. And yeah. that's not, you know, great to see, but, you know, um, 
that's why, I, like, if the Flames are going to try and reinsert Monahan in the lineup uh, at any point in the rest of the regular season, like, I, I think it will be on the wing. Uh, just because, you know, uh, he won't be as pressured uh, to be the center. Um, and, like, because he's not better than any of the four centers. So it's one of those where... You know, if you're wanting to shoehorn him in somewhere, he's going to have to be maneuvered in a certain way. And, you know, at this point, I don't even see a, a full-time roster spot unless Dylan Dubé falters. Isn't that weird, though? Like, Sean Monaghan goes from our first-line center to really not having a spot on this team. And I think, you know, when you're going to the playoffs in the position Calgary is, I think you definitely want bodies. And I could see Monaghan playing in the playoffs because somebody's hurt or somebody needs to sit out. Um, and, yeah, you know, I could want to, like, yeah, like, I'd say, like, the Flames have a bad game, too, say, and they want to shake things up. You can always draw airlift Monaghan into the lineup somewhere just to try and get the his offense in there uh or if you need more of a physical side you might remove monahan and put more of a banger in it it's having that flexibility helps but you know it is kind of depressing to see his role go from basically being uh johnny's sidekick to um you know virtually irrelevant Next within the I'm span the of a year Next time I'm in the press box, I'm going to count roughly how many kernels of popcorn are in a bag of popcorn up there, and we can figure out how much we're paying Johnny per popcorn kernel sitting in the press box. Yeah. Intrepid reporting, I Matt. I, yes. No, and, you know, with, uh, you know, Gaudreau and uh, Kachuk's contracts both expiring, like, uh, and Troy Brower's buyout coming off, uh, like, to remove Monahan's last year of his contract will only cost the Flames an additional uh, 500000 uh, over the Troy Brower uh, buyout and therefore saving like $5.8 million from the cap as it stands now. So, you know, like it's... It's doable. It sucks. Yeah, it sucks. But, uh, you know, like if things don't turn around for Monaghan, I think that's the likeliest destination unless they can trade him for, you know, less than whatever his buyout is. But And you, you know, mentioned like it. You mentioned uh, putting him on the wing and Dylan Dubé. And I think Dylan Dubé is the other guy who's kind of on the bubble with this team right now. Sometimes he looks good. Sometimes he doesn't look great. We've never really seen Monahan play wing for the Flames for any extended time. Is that something you try? Would you take Dubé out and put Monahan on, I guess, the left side with Yarn Croak and Coleman? I would try it at least and see. I don't think it would hurt uh, to, like, especially next month where like there are a bunch of games against some mediocre teams. Um, like, there's a whole like two week stretch where it's basically mediocre teams and you know like you could easily uh play around with things uh throughout that whole stretch whether it's uh putting monahan in the lineup or uh if you're going to call recall a guy like rujitsko or bring up peltier like there are a whole bunch of different options well right uh, now you don't really they're have available cap, cap space to bring anybody up true it's just there are options if you know, like I'm assuming that like you wouldn't recall anybody unless there's injuries, but you know, it, we'll see. Like it, it, it'll be interesting. Yeah, it just I don't know. It, I didn't know what to think of it as a longtime Flames fan. I mean, 23's been you know one of your top players on this team, and for him to go from like you said Johnny's sidekick to out of the lineup because there's no spot for him, it's amazing. I guess maybe how deep this team's got around him. Yeah, and it'll be something to look uh, over the next couple of weeks. Like, when do you slot Monahan back? And frankly, you know, with how the lineup is structured right now, I don't see him coming back uh, possibly for a couple weeks. So, you know, you know it'll be interesting I, to see if some rest might help his game. I was talking um, to someone else who was texting me about this. 
the day of the of the Arizona game, and I said I can see Monahan coming in like you said in a playoff game after somebody else doesn't look good, and I can see him almost being the playoff hero. Yeah, uh, entirely. I could see, and him that's coming why in and like just I'm not a, performing. I'm not you opposed, know, amazing. Yeah, I'm not opposed to him like getting some protracted rest over the next couple weeks, like as well. Like even if like he doesn't end up playing until like say the middle of April um again you know i think him like how would you say he goes very hard uh and like that's what has led to so many of his injuries and maybe some rest might help to reset and heal some of the recovery time like his hip surgery takes about a year to fully get over it and you know, uh, when we're getting into the back half of April, um, you know, like it, we're getting closer to when he had that operation. Uh, so, you know, if he can rest for a couple weeks, maybe uh, that might help heal his hip a little faster. So when, you know, if he is brought back in the lineup, he might be improved by just taking the time off. Yeah, I can see that too. With Monaghan out of lineup, we've seen some interesting Flames lines this week. We saw some interesting different lines um, in the early part of the week. We saw the first line, the Calgary's top line, get broke up. Um, we were seen in the San Jose game. It was the top line of Johnny Goudreau, Elias Lindholm playing with Tyler DeFoley on the right. The second line was Dylan Dubé, Michael Backlund, and uh, Matthew Kachuk. The third line, we were seeing uh, Coleman on the left with Yarncroak at center and um, Mongepani on the right of that line. And then we saw Lucic and Lewis and um, and Richie on the fourth line. Things went kind of back to normal against Edmonton. But Matt, as we've talked about, we have a wealth of options right now. I mean, again, we saw Sutter trying to make some changes. Right now, if you're looking down the stretch and looking towards playoffs, what would your ideal top nine pairings be? What would your ideal line lineup for this team be? Well, the first line, I think, has to be the first line of Gaudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk. Throw they your played best well trio. enough to earn that that's your top line. Yeah. And how do you say, if your bottom or middle six are struggling, I could see dropping one of like Kachuk down for a game or two. But realistically, I think that's the ideal setup. Um, then my second line ideally would be Manjapane, Backlund, and Toffoli. Uh, I think that Manjapane plays better and best this season when he's been with Michael Backlund. Um, so I think having those two together makes the most sense. And then Toffoli is your next best right winger, so throw him on the right side of that. And then your third line? Uh, Dubé or Monaghan uh, alongside Jaron Kroc and uh, Coleman. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the line, the lines that we saw ice in Edmonton, and I think you're right. You've got to keep that top line together. Goudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk, as you're going to playoffs, those guys have to be together. Monchapani, like, he should be a number two, but I could see moving... I, I, I thought it was the wrong idea in San Jose to put... Dylan Dubé on the second line. He hasn't earned that, but I could see swapping Mongepani and Coleman there. If you want more of a shutdown line, I could see moving Coleman, Backlund, and Toffoli together, but I have to agree with you right now. The right line is 88, 11, and 73, so Mongepani, Backlund, Toffoli is your second line. Yeah. And then, I mean, the only guy I'm not sold on is Dubé, but, you know, looking at what we've got, it's got to be Dubé, Yarncrow, Coleman is your third line there's no one on the fourth line that you're going to bump up there you don't put lewis there you don't put lucic there um yeah, yeah like it, i'm looking at like uh coleman and uh yarn as like two-thirds of a really good shutdown line yeah and uh, like dubay like how would you say if you're having dubay there um dubay is more of a pure offensive guy more than a two-way player but the other two guys are good enough where they can play an offensive game uh, so like if Dubé's setting things up or receiving a pass, like each one of those guys has about an equivalent offensive talent to ability. So yeah, it it's tough because you 
ideally want somebody better at, at both ends than Dubé on that line, but you know, it, it that's one where it is what it is. And, See, and you know. and I like the idea of Mongepenny Coleman Yarn Croak better, but I don't like Dubé then on the second line. Like it's you've got to play with the pieces you've got and it still feels like we're one short a winger. Yeah. And that's why like, I'm hoping that, uh, Monaghan, like with some time off, if he can sort of reset himself and you could put him with Backlund and Toffoli on the second line and Mangiapane with yarn croak and Coleman, I think sets the lineup better but you you would need Monaghan to be playing at a level where he should be on the second line, and frankly, he hasn't been. So, you know, and we'll you, see. And use that term reset. That's the term Daryl Sutter has been using. This is a bit of a reset for Sean Monaghan. Which I was not even aware. So that's... Yeah. But, yeah. And Monaghan, I think, just needs time to heal and you know get away from it for a bit uh watch and, and i don't and have daryl's re- exact words in front of me but he pretty much said yeah we should have done this earlier yeah and you know monahan is a, a tough player you know like to play through as many injuries as he has in his career and, and you know it has been to his detriment like as we're seeing right now uh he might be suffering from a couple of minor ish but significant enough things that having him sit for a bit might make things better for him yeah i guess the only other thing like i said i i like the idea of Mongepan of Mongepani and yarn croak and i guess the only other thing i might try then is a second line of coleman backland to foley um I, I don't know like it's yeah again i'm just i'm trying to minimize my usage of dylan dubay as bad as that sounds well, like alternatively, you could have uh, Dubé with Backlund and Coleman on the third line and bump Yarncroc up to the second line. Yeah, but you're right. Mangiapane's worked best with Backlund. Yeah, like I think like all four of those pieces, the two left wingers and the two centers are entirely fungible depending on what's mm-hmm. working at the time. Yeah, and, and it's, I mean, as we've talked about, it's a good problem to have, but I, th- I think really the top nine, let's not even say the top nine, the middle six are really interchangeable you're you know who's your bottom and you know who's your top we've kind of got a sandwich going on we know that johnny lindholm and uh maddie kachuk are your top line we know that lucic carpenter and lewis right now or um let's say you know lucic is line because i yeah I, richie could swap in there but i think that's your fourth line and then you've got two lines in the middle where you can play with them if you need to it'll be it'll be interesting to see what they do going forward and the only thing like and, and again you're looking at some of the asset you know, acquisition costs. And it's like, well, I'd like to see Yarn Krog. I'd like to see Coleman higher in the lineup at 4.9, but I guess it's also a, a good problem to have. Yeah. Depth helps. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, it, it's like, Oh, we have too many good players that we have to, you know, play musical deck chairs. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. Not really a big problem to have. <laughs> no. Well, Matt, I think that wraps up this week for the Flames. The Flames have a tough week ahead of them. Um, they've got four, what, four, three games since we'll talk next, all at home. Um, they play the Calgary Flames on the 29th. They play the LA Kings on the 31st and the St. Louis Blues on the 2nd. Three teams that are in a playoff spot. Let's look back at last week before we predict this week. Last week, I thought the Flames would beat San Jose and Arizona and lose to Edmonton. Boy, was I wrong. Last week, you thought Arizona and Edmonton would be the wins and St. Louis would be the loss. So you must have had your crystal ball ready. Yep. Well, that San Jose game, you know, I just had that sneaking suspicion that the Flames might take it a little too easy and casual against them. And sure enough, something felt fishy. Yeah, exactly. So three big games for the Flames this week. They've got two days off, 27th, 28th, and they play the 29th, the 31st, and the 2nd, so a day between each game. And uh, that'll be their last three home games before they go on a big road trip, which we'll talk about next week. Um, What are you predicting for this week, man? Well, all three of these games are going to be very tough playoff games. and This is really the toughest week I think the Flames have had on paper in a while. Well, yeah, and... uh, 
you'd have to go back to Minnesota, Minnesota, Colorado. Uh, at the yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, and even then, or uh, when they played Washington, Tampa. Yeah, Detroit, I was gonna say we had Colorado. Montreal in there. You know, like it, they've had a couple of games where you know, peppered with a, a mediocre team, but uh, frankly, the next four are gonna be tough ones because uh, we play LA again at, at the beginning of next week. On uh, the road, it, yeah, it, it'll be a, a tough stretch, but I think the Flames should probably win two of those three. Um, Questions: Which two? Rob, yeah, I'm gonna say they're gonna beat Colorado, and I think they're gonna beat St. Louis and lose to LA. Yeah, why do you think that? LA is doing really good, and uh, ever since uh, Kachuk and Doughty have had their thing, LA tends to get up more for these games and um you know i think that uh the one that daryl wants the most this week will be the la game uh just because uh his old team and all that but yeah i think that calgary is going like these are gonna all three are going to be very intense hockey games uh it'll pretty much come down to uh defensive coverage like if the flames can get the sloppiness that they've had over the last little while on the defensive side of things out of their game they'll they could sweep the week it's just you know they've been a little too lackadaisical over the last few weeks on the d side of things the so. last few times the Flames have seen the Colorado Avalanche Dan Vladar has been tending goal for them do you expect Jacob Markstrom for this one Yep. So be our last game against Colorado. So I'm expecting Markstrom in. Yeah, I'm expecting Markstrom, frankly, all for all three this week. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think you've got to play Markstrom for all three of these. Yeah, like I, I don't see uh, Vladar getting in until the back to back with Anaheim and San Jose uh, on the sixth and seventh of April, and then probably not again until uh, the Chicago Nashville back to back in the 18th and 19th just because there's enough space between everything that marks from should be able to play because it'll be every other day matt i'm gonna go two games win this week as well but i'm gonna do a different two i'm gonna say i think they win la because i think like you said daryl's gonna make sure these guys are good and ready for that one and st louis but i think they're gonna lose to colorado yeah well, the game that I'm most interested in this week is the Colorado game because, frankly, that's the team that the Flames are going to have to get through if they want to actually go to the Stanley Cup Finals. And, like, that's the biggest test for them uh, for the rest of the season, frankly. When um, when we met Colorado on the 5th, it was a 4-3 Calgary win in overtime. When we met them on the 13th, it was a 3 nothing Colorado win. Um, and I think, and as I said in both those, I don't necessarily think the Flames have to win the Colorado game. I think they just have to make sure that it's competitive. Yeah, I agree. Well, Matt, I guess uh, that's all we've got for this week. It's going to be an interesting week for the Flames as we finish off the... Uh, I, even though we've had a couple games on the road, I'd really say it's been a two-month homestand for the team. And we're finishing that off before their longest stretch on the road since Christmas time. So... Let's enjoy these and let's let's hope for some if even if we get some flames losses, I think we're gonna get some good flames hockey this week. Yeah, and you know, like they're they have been twenty uh four and two over their last twenty six games. So like they have been on fire, frankly, and the best team in the NHL over that span. They only have uh what uh, 17 games left. Uh, seventeen the rest of the way. Yeah. Like you know, if they're able to go say 12 and 5 over that the rest of their schedule that's more than enough to carry them on hot into the playoffs and you know uh, they just have to remain focused on the fundamentals and you know play Daryl hockey and go from there that's all we've got for this week and we'll talk to everyone same time next week and as always go flames go and Oilers suck Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. 
Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.